Health Resource Center's webinar series. This month, we will be talking about federal updates on telehealth policy. The National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is made up of the 14 telehealth resource centers who receive funding from HRSA. Uh, that is the listing of the 12 regional resource centers, and then there are two national resource centers, one on technology and CCHP, which focuses in, on telehealth policy. A few notes for today. Uh, know that your phone or your computer microphone has been muted. We will be taking questions via the chat. There will be time reserved at the end for your questions. We also ask that you fill out the post-webinar survey. The link will be posted at the end of the webinar on a slide. And please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted later. So if you would like to revisit the webinar and re-listen to something specific, you will have that opportunity on the consortium's YouTube channel. So we're just gonna get right into it because I'm sure folks may have some questions. So we like to leave a lot of time to answer those. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing a federal telehealth policy update, and I've added a few things about what's going on in the states as well. I do have to start off with a few disclaimers. Um, first off, my name is Meg Huang. I am from the Center for Connected Health Policy, so we are the National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. Um, any information I'm providing you today should just be considered information. It is not legal advice, so we have to make that very clear that Neither I nor CCHP is providing you with any type of legal advice. We always suggest if you are looking for a formal legal opinion to reach out to legal counsel. Uh, also, if I happen to mention a company or show a piece of equipment, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of financial arrangement or relationship with such an entity. So who is CCHP? Uh, the reason we don't have that type of arrangement is because we are primarily grant funded or we work on specific projects through um, other organizations who have engaged CCHP to do that type of work. We were established in 2009 as actually a California telehealth uh, policy organization um, as a program underneath the Public Health Institute, but we became the National Telehealth Policy Research Center in 2012 and been working in that capacity ever since. Some of the things that we do, some of the projects, most of you are probably familiar um, with us working with the consortium, but also we put out the 50 state uh, telehealth laws, Medicaid policies and regulations. Uh, that is also something that you can access on our website, either through a PDF version or through the interactive map. That is a snapshot of our website. So if you're interested in what's going on in a particular state regarding their telehealth policies, you just click on that state on that map there and they'll bring up all the information and we have it organized by very specific categories um, usually along the lines of reimbursement as that is where most of the established telehealth policy is but we also do have information on some other issues such as um, licensing and consent i'm sure most of you are familiar with this but just very quickly um, the three modalities of telehealth that most people are familiar with are live video store forward and remote patient monitoring and as i said a lot of the telehealth policy that is established is around reimbursement and how that is sometimes divided too is around depending on what type of modality you are using there are other factors that may steer how the telehealth policy is structured or what is written about it what are some of the restrictions or limitations to it um, including you know location but mentality is also one of the major ways that they do shape the type of policies uh, around telehealth and what may be reimbursed so I'm going to start on the federal level first and with Medicare. Uh, as some of you may be familiar, each year Medicare comes out with something called the physician fee schedule. Their proposals for changing that and that's really around like what they're going to be reimbursing in Medicare um, for the following year. So they'll come out with it usually around in the mid to late summer of uh, the previous year. There'll be a period for comment and then um, the policies get approved and they'll go into effect like the following year on the first. Of January and a lot of times there's usually something in there related to telehealth in some ways it may be that they're offering to add new services or they may be especially in recent years doing things that are a little bit different and trying to expand what might be available if you use technology to deliver services but a lot of the Medicare policy related to telehealth reimbursement 
is really structured by what's in federal law. So there's, there's a limitation as to what CMS can do as far as telehealth reimbursement. Um, it does require a lot of things, the limitations that are there, it would require like a law change, so a bill passed by Congress and signed by the president. But uh, there are a few things that they have been able to do, and actually in the last year or two, there have been a few changes in that federal law that gave uh, CMS a little bit more room to expand the services or expand how the services are delivered. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of telehealth policy, especially the reimbursement policy, is usually structured in a way where there are certain um, limitations based on certain features, such as location or who is providing the services or the specific services used uh, or covered or the modality used. And the Medicare CMS policies related to telehealth are no different. These are kind of the general areas where you see some type of condition or limitation as to what would be allowable. So what do we have? Geographic limitation, which I think a lot of people are probably familiar with. Underneath Medicare, you have to be in a specific, the patient has to be in a specific type of geographical location. It's a real, um, health professional shortage area or non-metropolitan statistical area, except, as I said, there have been some changes in law in recent years where they expanded things a little bit, where they've eliminated that geographical restriction. But they've been very specific changes. Now, these changes actually were made in 2018 and went into effect in 2019. And except for that last one, they've really been sort of in play for at least over a year at this point. So these are exceptions to that geographical limitation, and they're for treating specific types of condition. And the first one is for acute stroke. So they've eliminated the geographical limitation for acute stroke. They've also eliminated for end-stage renal disease services that are in the home. They eliminated the, that geographical limitation. And then also for substance use disorder in the home and co-occurring mental conditions. That third bullet for the substance use disorder in the home and co-occurring mental health conditions, that actually did not go into effect until July 1st of last year. And I did receive a lot of questions of like, well, how do we bill for that then? That didn't actually really kind of kick in the mechanism and how to do it until the first of this year because CMS was still working through the mechanics of like, well, how would you bill for that? What, what, what do you need to do to show that you did this type of service? So even though the policy was in effect um, in mid last year, really the mechanism of like, well, how do you do it and actually get reimbursed for it hadn't kicked in until the first of this year. And then the change that they did make in last year's physician fee schedule that kicks in this year was around opioid treatment programs. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but there are like a very narrow set of services, counseling, individual and group therapy services, that opioid treatment programs can provide via telehealth and that geographical limitation isn't on them. Um, so again, these are very specific services where they've like allowed a little bit more flexibility and it's usually because of a law change. Um, that last bullet about OTP though, that was a little unusual in like the justification they made for that. And like I said, we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, that wasn't necessarily a law change like we saw with the other three, but more of an administrative decision. Site limitations. So beyond just being um, the patient needing to be in a specific type of geo geographical area, they need to be in a certain type of site, a certain type of building of some sort. And it's very limited. Again, it's, uh, you know, very specific. You'll notice uh, most of these are uh, clinical, medical-based types of locations. Um, thing other locations where telehealth may be occurring that are not on here are like school-based programs. Schools are not located on this list. The home, except the home is eligible for those end-stage renal disease services and the uh, treatment for SUD or co-occurring mental health um, disorder services. Those are allowed to take place in the home. They don't have the geographical limitation. Um, again, a very specific type of exception to what you have typically in your policies, which are, it needs to be in a physician's office or a hospital or critical access hospital, et cetera. Who can deliver the service? Again, very specific list. What they did add this year, again, through that physician fee schedule change, as opposed to like a statutory change through a bill through Congress was opioid treatment programs, but only for a very limited list of services. So, 
this is something that we may need further clarification for from CMS. And it's actually something that we've debated internally at CCHP that wasn't quite clear. They are an eligible provider, opioid treatment programs are an eligible provider for a limited list of services that they can deliver via telehealth. It wasn't as clear in the language whether they can be an eligible originating site. Um, it didn't say they could be, and it didn't say they could not be. All it said was uh, they could provide these services uh, and they were not eligible to receive a facility fee. So that facility fee thing, saying that they weren't eligible, but it kind of threw us off as like, does that mean they can be an eligible originating site then? It wasn't made explicitly clear. So what we would need to wait for is probably when CMS comes out with their telehealth fact sheet, which they put out every year. It's actually a pretty nice comprehensive fact sheet that they do do. Um, and unfortunately, it usually does not come out on January 1st when all these policies kick in. It comes out a couple of weeks later. So hopefully when that comes out, that will clear up the question. Um, so for that's why I have not listed OTPs as an eligible originating site because it just wasn't clear to us and like, you know, kind of hit it, it might be, but they didn't, and they didn't explicitly say no, but then they didn't explicitly say yes. Unless they explicitly say yes, we tend to take that as a no from CMS, but hopefully there'll be a little bit more clarity when they come out with their telehealth fact sheets. Uh, I know this comes up a lot because FQHCs and RHCs are eligible originating site. They ask, can they be distant site provider? And the question is, and the answer is no. So it is very explicit in federal law um, how, what are eligible providers and FQHCs and RHCs do not qualify, but then we had the weird thing with the opioid treatment programs with last year's physician fee schedule proposal where the CMS went through a very complicated explanation of saying like, well, because these aren't typically like physician um, services that they give, they're not restricted by the federal statute, so we can make them an eligible provider. That was kind of, that was like, okay, that was kind of the reasoning that they gave and they were able to do this. You kind of wonder then if there might be other types of programs or other types of providers where they may apply that reasoning in the future year to make them eligible providers and they don't have to go through a statutory change. So that's something to keep your eye on and how that works and like how they do that. Services, um, now each year what CMS does is that they will, um, do one of two things. They will either propose new codes to reimburse for if the service is delivery of telehealth, or they will take in public comments or public suggestions of like what codes they should consider. And then they pass it through like basically this two tests. They say that's either a category one where, you know, we pass through this test or a category two. Category one is if the service that is being recommended for reimbursement is similar to something we've already approved or category two, if you give like a, a certain amount of evidence to prove that it's, it's just as good as in person, we can approve it too. Very hard for category, get something through category two filter. If it's the category two filter, they haven't said like exactly what evidence do you need and how much do you need of it. Does it need to be like, you know, five published peer review studies where there were, you know, um, a thousand people participating in the test or something like that. And they haven't clarified that. So it's very hard to get something in approved through category two. So usually they approve things through category one saying, well, these services are very similar to services we already approved. So what they did was, um, and interestingly, they said they didn't get anything from the public uh, as far as like potential codes to, to consider. Um, so they, but they did propose three codes and those were, um, opioid use disorder codes that they created and said that you could use to like bill for these services. And these are the codes that you are supposed to use for those uh, services that take place in the home. That change that took place and kicked in July 1st of last year, they said that these would be the codes that you would typically use to bill for those services. So um, there, the 2008 through 2088, and of course like, you know, other typical codes, they're kind of, they have a specific definition and there's also you know a specific time associated with each code on there so those were new to kicked in on january 1st now what i have been talking to this point are telehealth policies that they have in place there are a host of other services cms will reimburse for in medicare that they do not call telehealth they call them something else because the the thinking is 
it uses telehealth technology, so if we don't call it telehealth, we're not limited by all those restrictions that are federal law. It's just the geographical limitation, who is providing the services, location of the patient, et cetera. They got other limitations on there. There's other restrictions because of the way the code might be defined, uh, other qualifications on there, but those types of restrictions on telehealth do not apply here because these are not telehealth services, they're services delivered by some technology. And these are a, a grouping of them. And um, if you've been following this for a while, back in 2015, it was really just sort of first two, transitional care management and chronic care management, which is more of a remote patient monitoring type of way of delivering care. Those were the only ones in existence. We, we're now up to about, what is that, two, four, six, seven different categories of different types of services that use telehealth technology, not called telehealth, but CMS will reimburse for them. And we'll, we'll go over in a little bit more detail some of these. And I've grouped them by certain categories. They're sort of like um, things that sort of fit underneath a remote patient monitoring type of category are these set of codes. The so chronic care management, transitional care management, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. Those have been around for a couple of years at least. The one that was new last year was a set of codes called principal care management. And that is essentially your chronic care management codes, but you only need one chronic condition. So for chronic care management, when they first introduced that, and still the, the qualifications to receive those services that the patient needs to meet is that they have to have two chronic conditions and be at risk of death of like within a year or something like that. So certain conditions that um, a patient needs to have met or have features of before they could qualify for those services. Principal care management says you only need one chronic condition there. So they, they've made it a different set and you know, not needing like the additional two chronic conditions for somebody to qualify for those services. So those codes are uh, 2000, uh, 2064 and 2065. So that was something new that was in the fee schedule last year, kicked in January 1st. Another set of services is where they're calling internet-based communications technology. And again, this was proposed in 2018 and actually kicked into 2019, went into effect then. And these are quick check-ins that a provider does with their patient. It has to be an established patient. Uh, and it is probably something a lot of providers have been doing now, but haven't been getting reimbursed. It's that quick phone call check-in with the patient that's not a result of a visit that took place seven days before and then um, uh, took place seven days before, and that's not result in a visit seven days after. And you can have either a live video version of it or the remote, remote evaluation pre-recorded information is the store forward version of it. So it's that quick check-in with the patient, like let's say I call my doctor, I said we have an appointment uh, in you know next week, but I'm feeling fine, we go through a series of questions, and the, my doctor says, you sound like you're doing okay, let's book out for four weeks instead of you coming in next week. So again, quick check-in, not supposed to take a long time, does not pay a lot of money. I think it's about $14 is the reimbursement of, for, for these things. Um, it's meant to be a bit of a triaging thing. So the, the physician or the provider has more time to deal with like more complicated cases rather than, you know, um, spending not only the, the providers, but also the patient's time of like having to go in and like you find out you only need to see them for five minutes and nothing much happened but a quick check-in. So those kicked in, like I said, actually started reimbursing for that January 1st of last year. I don't have a good sense of how many people are actually billing for this. Um, I have not come across anybody yet. I haven't done an in-depth study who are billing for this, but I would imagine with such a low reimbursement rate, it might be a, like a volume. You would need like a high enough volume to, to make this you know, sustainable or break even and work your while to do it. Also included with um, other technology and some of the other things is the interprofessional internet consultation. Again, something that did kick in last year, uh, started January 1st of last year, was proposed in 2018. And this is a provider to provider consultation. Again, something that providers have probably been doing and not getting reimbursed for. It's where, um, you know, usually probably a primary care provider consults with a specialist about a patient. Uh, CMS is saying like, you know, we're going to pay for your time. And interestingly, they're saying they're paying both for the primary care provider's time and the specialist time, which is a little unusual. Uh, for, for some folks, um, they know this as e-consult, 
Uh, I know different parts of the country may have a different, different definition for that. In California, where I'm based, we call it the consult, that provider to provider consultation. And um, a lot of policies really pay just the specialist time, not necessarily the primary care provider's time. Interestingly, that Medicare is saying that they would pay for both. Although I heard recently from somebody saying like some primary care providers, um, because of the code that they have associated with them, you need to have a certain minimum amount of time and they actually don't meet that minimum amount of time a lot of the, in a lot of incidences. So um, that is one thing. Also that's now being made, made available and has been made available for the past year. Online digital evaluation services is to do online assessments, basically allow somebody else besides like a physician to do it and they gave them a code where they can like charge for it. So that that is like what they've termed an e-visit. One thing I want to cover because it is something that kicked in also on January 1st of this year is in Medicare Advantage plans. Now, um, prior to January 1st of this year, what Medicare Advantage plans are uh, supposed to do regarding telehealth and the telehealth policy, telehealth reimbursement that they have underneath their plans was they were supposed to do what the fee for service was uh, allowed them to do. So that was everything that I had covered before. So they were required to uh, cover those specific services, meet that geographical limitation, um, those eligible providers, et cetera. If they wanted to go beyond that, so for example, let's say they want to do store and board dermatology, that would be beyond that minimum that the was in Medicare fee for service. If they if a advantage plan wanted to do that, they would have to pay for that themselves. It wouldn't be calculated in their rate that they have with like their arrangement with CMS. They would have to pay for it themselves or the enrollee would have to cover it in some way. So a lot of Medicare advantage plans were saying, we need more flexibility. We want to provide services via tele, make that available to our enrollees, but you can't just kind of like, you know, limit us to this, what's in fee for service. So Congress in 2018 said like, okay, great. We'll, we'll give you more flexibility and everything. Um, the regulations for like how that was supposed to look were not finalized until April of last year, which I heard from some plans of saying like that was kind of too late for them to, to make the change for 2020 because they didn't have to, they couldn't start doing this until January 1st of 2020, but because the regulations came out so late last year, they're saying it's probably a little bit too late for us to like get that in place to ready to roll out in January 1st, 2020. Also, this flexibility was not a mandate. It was, it is that it is the flexibility in Medicare Advantage plans, whether they take advantage of it or not is like up to them. But basically it did eliminate a lot of those restrictions that you see in the fee for service program. So the geographical limitation was like eliminated. They could um, allow other services, they could allow other modalities. So they weren't just stuck basically with live video um, and they were allowed to like, you know, free up the location. So like the home could be an eligible site. What they did not free up for the Medicare Advantage plans were the type of providers. So that very limited list of providers was still something that they have to follow. Um, also, they require them to do other things, such as um, they have to use credential contracted network providers, and they have to follow the state laws related to telehealth of where the patient was as well. So those limitations, I have no idea if that's going to act as a disincentive to Medicare Advantage plans. I don't think for a lot of them it will, um, but it may make them alter their plans a little bit because it, it wasn't as broadly flexible as maybe um, they had hoped. And also this is not, again, not mandated on them. So we don't know um, how many of them are gonna take advantage of this. And we don't know how many of them were able to like make those changes, get them in place so they could roll it out on January 1st or not. So, but that is something to keep an eye on. I, but I would say like to get like a full feel of probably like, you know, how many plans are doing this, we might have to wait until 2021. Um, just because of the timing of when the regulations were finalized last year. A couple of other federal things to be aware of and keep your eye on. The CONNECT Act. So the CONNECT Act was introduced late last year. It would actually address some of those limitations that we see now in federal law. This is not all the stuff that it does. I just pulled out a few things that the CONNECT Act would do. And um, among them would be basically to give the HHS secretary authority to waive those limitations um, and also would allow FQHCs and RHCs to be distant site providers. So it does address a lot of those limitations that I had just gone over that you see in Medicare right now. The other thing to be aware of is the proposed regulations for a DEA registry. For those who um, may not be um, aware of this, when you do prescribing of a controlled substance and you use telehealth, 
the rules and laws that control our federal law. You might have heard it as the Ryan Hate Act or the Ryan Hate Laws or the Ryan Hate Regulation. So um, basically because the the where that type of those that section of the law came into place was underneath a bill called the Ryan Hate Act. So it essentially say, says, what are the situations where you can use telehealth to prescribe a controlled substance where the prescribing provider has not um, uh, had an in-person exam or met like the, the patient in person? Where, so basically, completely purely through telehealth, when can you do that with telehealth? And there are, um, six or seven, I can't remember offhand, but there are six or seven exceptions to like using telehealth do that. Uh, a lot of them, they're, they're very narrow. It's like the patients in the DEA registered facility during the time of the telehealth interaction, things like that. One of the exceptions is that the telehealth provider is on a DEA registry, which, you know, the DEA would create this registry. Um, the uh, Whoever provider got on there would have been vetted, be like a good actor, and it's totally fine for them to use telehealth and prescribe that way. Only problem was DEA never created the registry. So in 2018, again, Congress said, DEA, you got to create the registry. So they were supposed to have out their regulations, at least the proposed ones, by October, like October 26th of last year, or 2019. They missed their deadline. There was some indication that they had started moving them along the, the, you know, chain of like the process in December of early December, 2019, still not out yet. I don't know exactly when it's going to come out. Um, it's theoretically, they should have had them out soon, but as I say to people, I'm like, what's the punishment if they miss their deadline? I mean, I don't know if they have any consequences that they really face if they miss the deadline. Maybe some angry congressional members, but I, 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 they just haven't come out with it yet. I don't know, and it doesn't seem like, nobody seems to know like, you know, the exact date. Nobody has an exact, exact date of when they're coming out. So it is something we're always on alert on. I had kind of hoped that they would have been out by the time of this webinar, so I could have gone over some of that with you. Not out yet, we're keeping our eyes open. We'll have like, you know, potential, um, impact and implications. Um, only problem, one more thing on the DA registry I do want to say though, is that Congress that you were only supposed to have it out by a certain day, Congress did not give them any parameters on how they do the registry. So theoretically, the DA could come out with like a really, really onerous process to get on that registry that might discourage people from doing so. I'm not saying that they will. I'm just saying like, you know, they could come out with something like that. Um, or not, they can come out with like, you know, a very reasonable process that, you know, again, makes it uh, very, um, you know, attractive for people to get on that registry so they're able to do this then. So uh, keep your eye out on that. That is a major thing that will come out. People have been, I know people have been waiting for years on this uh, because uh, the opioid use disorder did spur this on, but I know there's like other reasons for telehealth providers, such as certain mental health conditions where you may need to use a controlled substance um, to treat the patient. So uh, keep your eye out on that. Hopefully it will come out in the next couple of weeks. A couple of federal trends that I want to go over, and I don't think a lot of these would be surprises to you, but there may be one or two that you might want to um, be alerted to. Telehealth and opioids, that's not going to go away this year. There's probably going to be more interest in that as well going on. There's like been a lot of funding, both on the federal and state level, in like, you know, funding pilots to address that, um, the opioid use disorder crisis and ways that to treat that, and telehealth has always been an element in some of those grants. Telehealth and maternal health. And not only on the federal level, I'm hearing on the state level, a lot of interest in like how you can use um, telehealth to uh, address, um, you know, maternal health and uh, during and after a pregnancy and um, what, where telehealth can like help uh, women, especially in like rural locations that where they may not have like, you know, ready, ready access to the professionals that they need. Telehealth and mental health, always a big thing. Still continues to be you see that pop up definitely in elements of it in like federal bills where they're trying to like increase where you can use um, telehealth to treat mental health uh, conditions we saw that like occur occurring mental health um, for uh, uh, if you have like a diagnosis for an opioid use disorder a lot of the home to be that trying to expand some of those policies more telehealth and HIV how to treat that uh, I know HIV has been like a very um, 
prominent topic in recent months for the administration, so how can telehealth work for that? And then telehealth and school-based school, um, school -based telehealth. Again, a lot of interest both on the federal and state level regarding how you can use um, telehealth in a school-based setting. Telehealth and the consumer. So this is something that I think the telehealth industry may have ignored in previous years is the telehealth and the consumer and how that interacts. And that I'm not just talking about direct to consumer. It's also about educating the consumer, having consumers be aware of telehealth and you know, creating that groundswell of demand too. Um, not may not necessarily be like a federal policy on that, but I think it's a trend that we'll probably see. Um, nationally and on the state level as people become more aware, more savvy of like how they can receive health services. And then broadband. Last year, the FCC came out with a request for comments on potential telehealth pilot that they were doing. $100 million, I think they were thinking of investing in that. Um, I have not seen anything about that, anything definite after that request for proposals. They may still be filtering through there. Broadband is always going to be like, you know, like reimbursement is always going to be a significant issue that people um, want to discuss and examine. State level. So it's a little bit early for us to, to get like a really good indication of like what are some of the uh, pieces of legislation states are introducing because a lot for a lot of states their, their sessions just started. So we're, we will have a better idea in about a month or two. Uh, but currently the situation is, is that, you know, 40 states in the District of Columbia have some sort of telehealth private payer law. It ranges from everything of, you know, a law that says the health plan, you can cover telehealth delivered services. There's no, there's, no law, there's no law against it, you can do it, all the way to health plan, you shall cover telehealth delivered ser services if you covered that service if it was delivered in person, and oh, by the way, you will pay the same amount as you would have in person too. So it's, and everybody else kind of falls in between there. So it, depending on your state, they have varying uh, requirements on what the health plans are supposed to cover. In your talk, if you're talking about fee-for-service Medicaid on the state level, everybody, every Medicaid program reimburses for some live video. Again, it could be very narrow, just as like they only reimburse for mental and behavioral health all the way to something that's very expansive of like we reimburse for everything um, that we cover. Store and farm, we're not patient monitoring, a little less popular. Um, and that's been a little bit harder for them. And there's usually like a lot of conditions like store and forward, it's only for certain conditions like dermatology and ophthalmology, we patient monitoring, it's usually for uh, chronic conditions. So there's usually like a lot of caveats involved for those reimbursement for those modalities too. Some state trends that I think we should be aware of, again, they mirror a lot of the federal trends, but telehealth, opioids, reimbursement, always a big issue. Broadband, school-based telehealth, telehealth consumer. The last one though I want to highlight, I am getting a lot more questions about how telehealth works for network adequacy purposes. And it has been hard for states to try to figure that out because where a lot of network adequacy requirements are now are based on time and distance, which kind of gets blown up by telehealth, especially the distance part of things. So states are kind of struggling on like, how do we count that towards network adequacy? Like when you're talking about telehealth, because we've been so used to doing it this way. That discussion is probably gonna kick in like a little bit more um, over the next year or two. Uh, there's been some work on, in some states, um, but it has been something that policymakers have been struggling with. It's like, how do you count telehealth in order to count it to meet network advocacy standards? So that's it, a high level overview of things that are going on, things that you um, wanted to make you aware of. This is CCHP's website. You'll find a lot of information on there and our contact information. Uh, just wanted to let people be aware of that the consortium's next webinar, um, the topic is to be determined, but it occurs every third Thursday of every month at this time. Uh, so be aware if you're not on the email list, definitely join and you can get updates on what the next topic will be and when the next webinar will be. Uh, we also ask that you complete our survey to see if this was useful to you, this uh, particular webinar. Uh, we do need to report these results because we are federally funded. They want to know like how we're doing. So if you could fill out the survey, that would be really useful and helpful to us. And that is it. And I'll open up for questions. I see the chat box. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, I am going to look at the chat questions now and take them like what came in first. So 
let me give me a moment to go through this. For those who are not aware, yes, the slides, we will make them available. Um, I think it, there will be a link that's um, posted either on the consortium's website or in our YouTube channel where you can access a copy of the uh, slide deck. Um, let's see. By the comment about schools, is correct or not an original site? So I was confused by that comment about schools. Is it correct that schools are not an original site? Underneath Medicare, schools are not an eligible originating site to act as a telehealth originating site to receive reimbursement underneath Medicare. So you're going to have to check your state. If you have, um, if you are dealing with the Medicaid population, some Medicaid programs do allow schools to be an eligible originating site. But if you are talking about Medicare, no, they are not an eligible originating site. Uh, will they be able to get a PDF of the presentation? Yes. Okay. If the home is not a site, how are companies such as Teldoc billing or capturing fees? This is so limiting, especially with RPM and other, um, all, other although low paying codes are popping up. So how probably Teladoc is doing that. So the home is an eligible originating site for some things. I can't speak for Teladoc, but what probably some companies are doing, they're doing direct to consumers. Consumers might be paying out of pocket. They may also be contracted with a health plan. So the health plans policy may allow them to do that depending on what type of policy we're talking about. So if it's an employer-based policy, these Medicare restrictions aren't limiting on them. So just keep in mind, all of that when I was in the beginning, when I was talking about those limitations, that's Medicare. So when you're talking about employer plans, when you're talking about Medicaid, a private health plan, that's a whole different story. There, there's a lot more flexibility about that. So when you're talking about a telehealth company, how they're doing it, one or two ways, they may have a contract with a health plan, which is not a Medicare thing. So they have that flexibility there and they may also be doing it direct to consumer where the consumer is paying out of pocket. So that is probably like where they are making their money on things as opposed to limitations that you are um, imposed on by Medicare. And now with the Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Advantage plans now starting beginning of this year do have that greater flexibility Although contracting with a teledoc, they may find that a little bit more difficult because the regulations do say they need to be credentialed network providers. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility now for Medicare Advantage plans. But when you're talking about Medicare fee for service, you're limited. And I absolutely agree, you are limited by that. Um, I'm tracking reimbursable chronic care conditions being weight, blood pressure, heart rate, pulse oximetry and respiratory rate, are these correct and are there others? Um, I'm gonna assume that you are talking about, um, can you build that underneath those chronic care management codes? Look at the definition of the codes. Uh, CMS also usually have FAQs about that, especially for providers and like what they're supposed to do. So I would also suggest that you um, go and, and pull that down. And they're actually fairly good, fairly good fact sheets. but look at the definition for that. That, that kind of sounds about right to me. I'm assuming you're talking about this chronic care management and maybe not remote physiological monitoring. The definition of like what code should bill, uh, uh, the, A, the codes that are available to bill underneath those, those set of services and what exactly that means, what those code means, like the time, the time that you took and also like what you're, you're doing are in those definitions. So I would check there. Uh, it sounds like you're, you are looking at maybe the chronic care management codes and the remote physiological monitoring codes. So I would check out those two. Um, available recording, PDF, uh, let's see. I'm assuming the Connect app has not been passed. What's its current status? No, it was just introduced at the end of last year. <clears throat> I, given what's going on in DC, I have heard this may not be the best year for legislation to pass, just because of a lot of things that are going on in DC. Um, what has historically happened with past telehealth bills is they haven't really gone anywhere, but what has happened is that elements from telehealth bills have been taken out of those bills and placed into larger bills. Some of those statutory changes that I went over that I said took place in 2018 and kicked in in 2019, those were not in telehealth bills. Those were actually in larger bills where they took elements from telehealth bills and dropped them into bigger bills, like the Support Act or the Balanced Budget Act. I'm not sure the Connect Act will pass this year. 
Um, but there is a possibility that elements of it, like has happened historically, might be taken and put into like a larger bill and that larger bill gets passed and then that's like where you might see like a statutory change. Please provide a list of HIPAA compliant companies that I can use for the telehealth software for me to use as a network provider. I would suggest that you get in touch with whoever your telehealth re regional research center is. I, I don't know if this person who asked this question, what state you're located in. Contact your telehealth resource center, um, the regional telehealth resource center. They're, they're a great resource. If you are not using them, you really need to like contact with them because a lot of a lot of great free information is available from the telehealth resource centers. Uh, I know a lot of people rely on the telehealth resource center's own information to provide their their advice, their consultative services to others. Just go straight to the source and talk to the telehealth resource center. Uh, can you can track them? Okay, so somebody gave a link for the Connect app. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, specifically, where are the PDFs on the TRCs? Thank you. Uh, so you can access any telehealth resource center's website and get contact information through the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers Central website. Um, uh, let's see, was that on our previous slide here? Let's see, no. So uh, there is, I think you guys may have, it's under www.telehealthresourcecenters.org. That is like the central uh, consortium website where you can access any regional, any telehealth resource center, like find a connection to them there. So you can access your regional telehealth resource centers or one of the two nationals. So you can find that information there. Uh, let's see, you can find the recordings. PDS. Since the registry is not available, does that mean you cannot prescribe controlled meds by telemedicine? No, there are other exceptions, but they're very narrow. Um, like I said, one of them is, oh, the patient's in the DEA registered facility at the time of the telehealth interaction. Another one is, oh, the patient is with a DEA registered provider during the telehealth interaction. They're really, really narrow. Uh, that is some of the ways that people have been able to prescribe through telemedicine through these narrow exceptions. So you don't need the registry, but you need to fit into one of those narrow exceptions. Uh, where can we track changes related to the, to the prescribing controls? I'm assuming you're asking like, when will you get information if the DEA uh, maybe releases the registry? You can um, join the CCHP newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter, just like an overall newsletter. And then every week we do sort of like a highlighted issue of the week or something. So basically it's a weekly email that you would get from us. So definitely when the DEA registry comes out, that's that's going to be like one of our newsletters. We're going to do an analysis of it. So I would say join the CCHP newsletter website or just check our website um, fairly frequently. And we'll definitely have that information up there when it's available. What section of your site will the slides be recording on? Um, I think that may have been answered already. It should be, I think there's like a little section where um, it says, uh, we have a YouTube channel, so you can also go through there. Um, but there's also, I think, uh, like a resources section on the National Center. Sorry, that, that's my bad. I should be a little bit more familiar with that. What trends are you seeing in teledentistry? Oh, that is another area where I am seeing a lot of people asking questions about that. And like, you know, what about teledentistry? Getting that reimbursed. So teledentistry, part of it is one of it, is why it's popular. Um, for some areas, it's usually more popular when you're talking about children because you can get coverage when it's children, but there's been greater interest in how it can help seniors as well. So there's been interest in like having it maybe in locations where seniors tend to go more towards than like saying in a school. So when you're talking about children, usually school based is kind of where a lot of people are looking at. When you're talking about seniors, there's exploratory, exploring like where the seniors might be able to receive uh, dentistry services. Teledentistry tends to skew more towards children just because the reimbursement is there to cover dental services. A highly undercovered area, professional, you know, services, I totally agree. Dental is really important, should be covered more. Um, but because there seems to be more opportunities to cover children, you usually ski, see um, teledental taking place more in like a school-based setting where you can access children just because there seems to be more coverage for them. Um, but there's been greater interest now in like, you know, how can we help with senior care? Uh, nothing widespread, but more like 
starting from like the initial thing of like, let's try to get more policies to cover teledental. And it's been slowly gaining speed. There's always been a little bit interested. It's always been kind of hanging around there as far as like policymakers as like a potential area too. Um, so I, I think probably it might go a little bit hand in hand over the next year or two when you're talking about school-based services. School-based services where that is like a lot of talk is, is around prov provision of mental health services in the schools. Teledentistry is also not as popular as the mental health, but that's been brought up a lot too when you're talking about school-based. Can I apply for your services for developed countries? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. You can contact either the consortium or me at CCHP and we can try to figure out what you're looking for. How can we access DMS is telehealth fact sheet? Oh, so um, we'll usually put it out, all the TRCs, we'll put it out as soon as that's available. <laughs> really, the easiest way is probably try to Google <laughs> CMS telehealth fact sheet, to be quite honest. I checked maybe a couple of days ago, 2020 is not out yet. They, that tends to come out in February. They date it as January, but it doesn't come out until usually around February. One time it came out in April. Um, but you could also just, you know, be on the newsletters for the consortium or CCHP or one of the TL health resource centers. We all put it out. As soon as that thing is available, we do also put it out. But you can also Google it. Uh, quite honestly. Oh, and also CCHP just recently put out a new resource. Um, it's on our website. It's a little bit of catalog of like CMS's like uh, resources that they put out, like the telehealth fact sheet, the eligibility analyzer. For those who aren't familiar, if you're trying to figure out if you're an eligible originating site, it gets complicated. There's like a link that CMS has put out where you can just type in your address and they'll tell you if they if you are or not. That's called the eligibility analyzer. So we have like a resource that's um, a, a catalog of that, a little document where we pulled all that together so you didn't have to like do a Google search for, oh, chronic care management and then the telehealth fact sheet. So you can go to the CCHP websites underneath our resources tab and like just pull up that document. Um, and also if we also have on there like letters that CMS has sent out when somebody's asked them a specific question. So people have found that useful as well. So that's all on there in this resource that we've compiled together. And if you guys have stuff like that as well, let us know and we'll include it in the resource too. So we want to make that available to, to folks. There are a lot of questions here. Let me see if I can get through these a little more quickly. What about physicians just calling patients? Would that be reimbursable for telehealth? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the virtual check-in codes. <clears throat> that one, you can arrange for a time. The physician can arrange for a time to talk with the patient um, and get paid for that. But the remote evaluation, the store and forward version for that, they, that CMS said, I believe they said that had to be patient initiated. So you might be able to get that reimbursed for the virtual check-in codes. And assuming that's what you're asking about. What trends are you seeing for speech language pathologists and audiologists? Oh, so those allied health professionals, PTs, OTs, audiologists, speech language pathologists, you guys have a hard road to travel. A couple of years ago, there was a little bit of a bump and a little bit of interest in there. I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm seeing like, it's popping up less as far as policy discussions that I've been involved in. I mean, I try to bring up saying there are all these professionals that you need to cover. Medicaid has been a little bit better about that, um, but you're, if you're talking about Medicare, I think part of it has been things like the opioid crisis has kind of pushed some of these other things off of policy bankers radar. So they've been focusing on addressing the opioid crisis. So I would say, State level Medicaid, it's probably a better arena right now for these allied health professionals. I'm actually not seeing a lot of questions. I, I bring it up sometimes. I do not lobby, but I do provide technical advice and education. So when I'm asked a question, I, I do bring it up. But it's, it's, it's just like other things have like kind of taken the attention away and one of them is the opioid crisis. So you'll see like a lot of things around prescribing and that mental and behavioral health types of services too. Can you provide remote patient monitoring service to Medicare members at zero dollars? Not quite sure what that question means. Are you saying, can you provide it and not charge Medicare? Um, if you want to email me a little bit more details, that's fine because I'm not quite sure what that question means. Any trends with HIV prevention? Um, 
as far as trends, you mean how the care is delivered? I can't really speak to that. But as far as interest in policymakers, yes, that was one of the federal ones that I said, like, there seemed to be more interest. And this administration has made HIV, they've like highlighted HIV as something that they're interested in. So there, there may be a little bit more of a push on um, HIV, uh, dealing with HIV and using telehealth on there as well. So you might see that more on the federal level. Trying to think if I'm hearing things from the states. Not yet, but like I said, it's been kind of early days for states. We might get a better idea in next month or in March on like where states might be going. Any update on telerehabilitation, especially for tele-OT? Mentioned that earlier when I was talking about allied health professions. Do you have program to support implementation telehealth in developed countries? Um, again, you know, uh, um, I would get, you know, uh, contact the Southeast Telehealth Resource Center and some of the other telehealth resource centers. I know Southeast Telehealth Resource Centers do work sometimes like um, their, their parent organization works sometimes with um, uh, other countries. Uh, you can do that. You can send a message in through the consortium. We'll make sure it gets to them that way. Do you have any insight regarding how direct to consumer telehealth can charge out of pocket? Medicaid point, points, I'm assuming, in our state can't be charged for any, oh, Medicaid PTs, maybe? Uh, and I'm confused by it. Um, so how can how direct to consumers are charging for telehealth? My guess is is I'm I'm not quite sure where this this question is coming from. Are they are you asking about how they are charging a Medicaid and release? So when you're doing direct to consumer, it is the consumer's choice to like select that provider and pay out of pocket. So basically, what the telehealth company is doing is that they're not submitting a reimbursement to like a payer like either health insurance or Medicaid or Medicare to get reimbursed, the patient has paid out of pocket. So the patient has taken all that expense. So that's usually how, you know, roughly direct to consumer works. Um, your question about Medicaid is, I mean, I'm assuming you're saying like, how are they doing this if it's a Medicaid enrollee uh, taking advantage of a direct to consumer? company and getting that services. And again, that's probably because the direct to consumer company, I'm not picking on them, I'm just using them as an example. Let's say they go to Teladoc. Teladoc probably isn't submitting a reimbursement to the Medicaid program. Like I said, their, their costs are covered by whatever the patient has paid out of pocket. I, I think that's what you're trying to get at. Um, can you please delineate the difference between CCM and PCM? I thought I heard you mention, I may have misunderstood CCM is reimbursable only for patients who are terminally ill. No, what I was saying is, kind of the most distinguishing feature is like when you have chronic care management for a patient to qualify for receiving those services they need to have two chronic conditions or be at risk of hospitalization or death within like the next 12 years or not 12 years 12 months or something like that it, it it's like a really odd way of saying that but basically it's like you need two chronic conditions uh pcm you only need one so that's kind of like the sort of most distinguishing feature there's like other details involved there but that's kind of the shorthand for that can you clarify what differentiates CMS from federal entity? Is CMS technically driving the federal rules for telehealth? So the way this works is that CMS administers Medicare. Where telehealth is concerned is there are rules in how CMS administers the telehealth policies um, in the Medicare program um, that's being driven by federal law. So those restrictions such as needs to take place in a rural area, that's in federal law. So CMS itself can't really mess with that too much because it's federal law. They got to follow what's in federal law. What they can do are certain creative things that they have done is that federal law only applies to things that they have specifically says telehealth. CMS has come up with a reasoning. Well, these are uh, services that um, we're not calling telehealth, though they use telehealth technologies, that those, those rules don't apply, those federal laws don't apply because they're not telehealth. They are 
you know, things that the law had to consider, such as remote patient monitoring type of technology, or, you know, they're saying like these weren't services because the, the, the federal law covers um, physician services. So basically what they're saying is what's in federal law, those services that those federal laws cover, they're a replacement, like a one-to-one -one type of replacement for services that you, the physician would provide and that Medicare covers. Um, if they had done it in person, but they're saying, well, there's all these other services that are, you know, you're, you're, uh, there's not like a one-to-one -one comparison with in-person services that, you know, they're not telehealth then, so, and they don't come underneath the federal restrictions, so they have a little bit more flexibility. So that's kind of like the sort of two buckets of what they're working on. Restrictions on telehealth, things classically, we might want to call it classically telehealth, that they are, um, restricted by because it's in federal law and we require a law change, but then all these other services that, you know, they're saying like, well, aren't a replacement for like an in-person services. They're, they're different things, but they use telehealth technologies that they're not calling telehealth, that they have more flexibility where they're not restricted by those uh, limitations. I've got a lot of questions and I only have a few more minutes. So let me just try to get through as much as these as possible. We are a Florida-based practice that, ra that rounds in skilled nursing facility, assisted living, and inpatient home. Are there any upcoming changes for patients who are truly homebound to eliminate the site originating requirements? They are desperate for access to care. Skilled nursing facilities are ineligible originating site. Probably where you're running into trouble is that geographic limitation. It's going to require a statutory change. So if you're talking about peer telehealth, then there's a limitation there. If you're talking about like trying to provide them with like chronic care management services, there's a little bit more flexibility there. You don't have that geographic limitation. I'm going to guess probably what you're running up against is um, a geographic limitation because a skilled nursing facility is an eligible originating site. But probably the thing that's, that's limiting you is like the geographic limitation, law change. Um, what is, would a hypertensive Medicare patient be eligible for remote patient monitoring through their PCP? Does it vary from state to state? Uh, it would not vary from state to state if, if you're talking about Medicare. So Medicare national, uh, would a hypertensive Medicare patient be eligible for remote patient? You're probably talking about the patient care management services. So check out the codes and how they define them to see if that fits in with the services that you are offering. It's gonna depend on what your services you're offering. Do you have any insight as to why a HPSA area doesn't equate a rural health area? What makes an MSA? Our specific concern is mental health, and there's a huge deficit area, and we are hip, so we can't do telemedicine. It's because they have a very specific, excuse me, specific definition of what a rural hip set is. And it's based, it's this complicated formula based on a census. My guess is that it is what has like caused you to not qualify. I am in California, 98% of my state is disqualified from being an eligible originating site because that geographical limitation, swaths of Death Valley do not qualify because it's too close to a metropolitan statistical area based on their calculation. It is just the way that they have done the calculation. Please provide a list of telehealth software companies for HIPAA. Again, contact your telehealth resource center. They should be able to help you out with that. Why aren't states practicing by federal rules is because they have a lot more flexibility with their Medicaid programs. So they are able to do that and actually you would find, it's not that they're not practicing by federal rules, they do not need to mirror the Medicare policies. So the federal laws are on the Medicare program, it is not on the Medicaid programs and how Medicaid programs set up their telehealth reimbursement and their telehealth policies. And for the most part, a lot of states are a lot broader in what they do uh, with telehealth reimbursement than what you see in Medicare. What are common telehealth services FQHCs are currently taking advantage of that are reimbursable? They can take advantage of like the virtual check-in. Um, they can take advantage of the chronic care management codes, those types of codes. Um, they are, some states, again, to go back to the state example, some state Medicaid programs give FQHCs a lot more flexibility and some of them allow them to be distance site providers. So they are able, depending on what payer is paying for the enrollee and some private some health plans also, um, like Medica Medicaid Advantage plans, do use FQHCs as um, distance site providers as well. So it depends on like what uh, payer is paying for the uh, patient. You mentioned geographic boundary restrictions for FQHCs being lifted. Can you expand on that more? It's not that the geographic boundaries were being lifted for FQHCs. Um, what I was saying was that was in the Connect Act. It's a proposal. 
So that FQHCs, if the Connect Act passes, would not be one of those um, entities that would have to be restricted by the geographic limitations. It is not in place yet. It is proposed in the Connect Act. Can you go over the implications of the home being the originating site? I'm not sure what you mean by implications. It's, it's allowable as an originating site underneath Medicare for certain services. Um, Medicaid programs, again, will vary. Some of them do allow the home to be originating site for certain services as well. Can you deliver the opioid treatment to a group of patients each at their own home? It did not sound like that is reimbursable. Yes, I'm assuming you're talking about it, it is. It depends on what it depends on what provider you're talking about. Um, it should. It is opiate treatment programs. So have a more limited set of services that they're able to reimburse for. If you're non opiate treatment program, you can um, reimburse uh, deliver uh, somebody um, opioid use disorder services and co occurring mental health services. So um, I think that's what you were asking. So it, it would depend on like where you fall in. Are you a non-opiate treatment program? What services you're delivering? You got a little bit more room on the services that you're delivering. But if you're an opiate treatment program, you're a little bit more limited in what you, you can deliver in the home. What is Medicare planning for changes to telemedicine for reimbursement in 2020? Currently, as you understand it, only Medicare Advantage plans can get reimbursed for telemedicine. No. Please double check that. And what, so no, not only Medicare Advantage plans can get reimbursed for telemedicine. We just went through a, an entire thing where you can get it reimbursed as a in, underneath fee for service. Medicare Advantage plans um, have to reimburse for that. That's their for what they have to reimburse for fee for service. They can do more if they wish to do so. So um, yeah. Uh, why Puerto Rico is not included in the map and telehealth? services. So it's been, Puerto Rico has been very interesting. It's been um, a little bit difficult to suss out exactly what they do with their Medicaid programs. It's just that we've had a little bit more difficulty in understanding what they do. Um, they've gone through some, some changes there and understanding exactly what they are reimbursing in their Medicaid program. Can you explain a bit more about the trend and what the vision is on telehealth and broadband? If you go by what the FCC put out there, and I can only stay on for a few more minutes and I've got so many messages, um, questions. So if you are talking about looking at what the FCC proposed in their pilot project and their request for comments, they are very interested in remote patient monitoring. They're also interested in like the the consumer being more um, involved in it and taking control. It's just, uh, you look at the FCC proposal, kind of some of the elements that they were talking about, it was very remote patient monitoring heavy. Um, I don't know if that's eventually what they're gonna wind up with. Um, I did take a look at some of the comments people provided. There were some concerns that have been raised, not that anybody was against remote patient monitoring, but just how they were structuring the program. It's gonna be a wait and see what um, the FCC comes out with that. Do these apply? Okay, there are remote physiological monitoring codes and chronic care management codes. Do these apply to all Medicare patients or just those on Medicare Advantage plans? It, that, those apply to fee-for-service as well. Is telehealth allowed for post-op follow-up visits if not billed, but then as part of a global surgical bill? They, they are allowed, I believe. To get the slides, looks like they will be, uh, yeah, there will be a PDF. You, you guys should be able to access the PDF for this. So as long as this provider has a DA license, can they prescribe the controls? So I assume you're saying as long as they're DEA registered. Um, so as long as they are DEA registered, they have that ability to prescribe. They can prescribe. Can they prescribe via telemedicine? They use telemedicine um, underneath the DEA language. Um, you got to fall into one of the exceptions. You just, it's not one of those, you, you, you've got the <laughs> DEA your DA registered and you, you're able to, you have the license, you can't just apply it in, or prescribe it in any situation. If you're using health, you've got to fall into one of the exceptions. Uh, get the slides. Thanks, Robin. For mental health behavioral SUD providers, are they able to work remotely to see patients at the clinical site? So you're, you're allowed to do all this. The question is whether you're going to get reimbursed for it. So it's going to depend what payer you're, 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 you're trying to bill for that. So 
there's nothing, I mean, there are maybe professional rules and regulations, but typically there's no law saying you can't use telehealth provide services. What all these policies are is, will you get paid for providing those services? Um, you know, there are certain exceptions, you know, such as like when we're talking about prescribing controlled substances. But for the most part, it, you can use telehealth to provide the services. The question is, are you going to get paid? And it's going to depend on, you know, who's paying for that patient's care. Is it the Medicare program? Is it the Medicaid program? Is it a private payer, out of pocket, whatever? So it's going to depend on who the payer is for the patient. Uh, teledentistry reimbursement is difficult if the state's dental practice doesn't address teledentistry. That's not, there's no question there. Can you speak to Medicare policies on using telehealth with hospice and palliative care services that are commonly provided in patients' home? Oh, yeah, palliative care, another issue where why isn't telehealth used more? So that's actually not one of the, there are only very narrow exceptions on where you can provide services in the patient's home and get reimbursed by Medicare. And it's not palliative care services. It's, it's acute stroke, end stage renal disease, um, and it's co-occurring mental health disorders when you've been diagnosed with an opioid use disorder and so opioid use disorders services, so unlikely um, you would get reimbursed for that underneath the Medicare population uh, policies there because home would not qualify as an eligible originating site. It's, it's, it's an area where it's like, why isn't this allowed more? So many uses for it. It would be so much better for the patient, but it's just not where the policy stands right now. The state telehealth docs show some states cover other states, what exactly does that mean? For example, Tennessee has zero reference for RPM. I mean, that means written miss. Oh, so what that means is, so where you might see the state that does have a policy, that's like their state policy. So it might be a Medicaid policy, it might be something they passed in state law or have regulation. If it's blank, it may not mean they're not doing it, they're not covering it. It's just that we haven't found an official document that says that. Um, and that might simply be because it's not online or we just haven't found it. If you, if you have that, uh, please provide it to us. But what we do, our 50 state, we have to have documentation somewhere that that is the policy that exists because people will always say, where's, where's your proof? Where's your source of this? So if it's blank, it's because we haven't found anything. That's why. And states vary. That's, that's why, you know, Tennessee is different from Mississippi. States do, do it differently. Thank you, Wendy, for doing the fact sheet link. Let's see. Are non-opioid control substances also restricted with telehealth? Uh, good question. Non-controlled substances prescribing, that's state law. So it's going to depend on what your state says. And actually some states do allow telehealth to be used to prescribe, um, to prescribe mostly live video. You gotta do through a live video. So check your state. It's gonna be up to the state in deciding that. Non-controlled substances, controlled substances, federal law. Uh, could telehealth be used for post-op care versus in-person visit? Definitely can be used. Again, the question is, will you get reimbursed? It's going to depend on your, your, um, who the payer is. Why is Medicare specifically so limiting of telehealth services? Because it's old. <laughs> Those are old rules. Those like went into place, let's see, 1997 was when they first had the telehealth policies. It got us updated in 2000, major update in 2000. Then there were just like little updates throughout there. Think back to 2000, what was your technology then? There's, your there's the answer to your question. So typically policy develops at a much slower rate than technology. Policy is probably about a decade behind of where the technology is and what it can do. That's your Medicare policy. It's just because it's old, it hasn't been updated in a while. They made little changes. That's why, that's what we're, why we're stuck with what we have. Just old. <laughs> so. I don't mean to be like, you know, glib about that, but that is really the situation. It just hasn't been updated. Um, do you have to opt out of Medicare in order to build direct to consumer on telehealth? Oh, so this has always been like a, a tricky question of like, you know, what if somebody is um, covered by Medicare, but they're saying they want to pay out of pocket. And I, I think, and I'm, to think here. I think it has to deal with, um, you have to give them notice uh, that uh, about, that you're doing this and that they're aware of it. I think it's called an ABN. Um, 
uh, Roxanne in Strong Chan Cham, if you can send me like an email, I can give you like a little bit more of a better answer there. I, I just can't think of it like offhand. And I'm like 10 minutes over. I'm going to stay on for like another five minutes to try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, if I don't get to your questions, I do apologize. Definitely send them to either through CCHP or through the Telehealth Resource Center, and we'll try to answer them via email. Can you put the Survey Monkey in the link chat box, not a hyperlink to Zoom? Trey, can you please do that for me? If you haven't done it already, board certified behavioral analyst was not listed as an eligible type of provider, not for Medicare, because you aren't. Sorry, Medicaid programs. Check your Medicaid programs. Some of them do. Um, last post is for the CMS back in January. Yeah, like I said, sometimes it takes them a while to update that fact sheet. Uh, okay. Da -da -da -da. Um, what, what is your email? You can email us at info at cchpca.org. My question is whether we can provide a service for free in Medicare to Medicare enrollees. Again, that's like that, that, that ABN question. Oh, check that um, Medicare resource thing that we have in there because I think actually there was a letter from CMS that directly talked about that. So that's on cchpca.org. It's in our resource tab. It's like one of the the top entries there because it, it, it we just recently released it like about a week or so ago it's a medicare sort of like resource guide thing of like their official stuff um i think there was actually somebody had asked that letter there so definitely check that out it's one to confirm whether medicare advantage plans are still restricted to the established set of providers even if they are covering telehealth as a supplemental but oh if they are covering it as supplemental benefits so keep in mind they are limited by that list of providers if they want that calculated into the price of their contract with CMS. If they want to go beyond like the limitations that are now in there, you know, even with the flexibility that kicked in at the beginning of the year, such as like we want to do other providers, such as allied health professionals, um, then those are called supplemental telehealth benefits, which means that then comes from either the patient, the enrollee pays for it or or the Medicare Advantage plan covers it in some way. So they can't do it. It's just that CMS is saying we won't pay for it. So that's where that stands. Uh, any new CMS telehealth regulations specifically impacting nurse practitioners providing care this way? I don't know what they're gonna come out with with this year's physician fee schedule. So we're just gonna have to wait and see what they come out with this year's physician fee schedules. There may be something um, in there. Um, so I haven't heard of anything. It's new, we're only three weeks into the new year. So it's, it is new, we may hear something more later on. We've heard this comment a couple of times, but Remote Health Solution has software available for RPM and CCM for telehealth services. Okay, I'm not a question. How does being designated as an area of critical need impact the geographical limitation? Um, I'm not quite sure. Like I said, the way they, for telehealth, they actually have this complicated formula based on census information as well. Um, so I'm not sure that actually would impact it. So not the best answer I can give you, but I, I, I'm not quite sure because uh, it, just how they calculate it for telehealth uh, eligibility standards is based on other things. Will the bears, yes, okay. Please repeat your response regarding recommended resources on purchasing hardware. Again, if you're talking about, if you have questions about hardware and software, who you should use now, caveat, telehealth resource centers cannot like say one is better than the other, but they can tell you about what's available out there. If it's about technology, maybe go and contact the telehealth resource center on technology. They're called TTAC, they're based out of Alaska, or you can contact your regional telehealth resource centers. Are the GT modifiers still used? Sometimes. So um, yeah, CMS wanted you to use the 95, I believe. Some Medicaid programs still use GT. Some private payers still use GT. It is all over the place. Um, so, so it depends, again, depends on what payer you're using. The, the, the GT is still used by some programs. Uh, why are nationally board certified nurse coaches not mentioned as providers is because they are not mentioned in the statute. If you're talking about Medicare. Uh, we have the wrong time on calendar. It's being recorded. Oh, and I think I went through all of them. So thank you everyone for sticking around. If I did, um, there are questions you guys have about this, more questions that you didn't get to ask, either send it through to the consortium's website or you can contact CCHP, info at cchpca.org. 
please fill out the survey. It would really help us out. I hope you will, um, you know, join our the consortium mailing list and also the CCHP mailing list. We again, that's a great way of like keeping track of what's going on in the policy world. Um, and also, please join us for our next webinar. I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you, everyone, and hope you have a great day. Bye.